Good morning, again, to many of you. Welcome to Jubilee United Church. Those of you who are here in person, those who are joining online or on the telephone, we are all welcomed to the traditional lands that Jubilee United Church is located on and honor and respect the ancestors who lived on this land before, who currently still reside in this area and will live with us for many years to come. We're all invited to recognize the living history of these lands and honor our connection to it and the history of the Hunkaminam and Squamish speaking peoples. I'm the Reverend Graham Brownmiller and I get to be privileged to work as the lead minister in this community of faith, along with Gabrielle McClarty, our community life minister. We work with other staff and volunteers to bring about the vision and ministry of Jubilee United Church. We're grateful for all of you who join the co-creation of God's kingdom here and now. While we have many ways of wonder, welcoming people to our community, we know that the church in general has not always offered a great welcome. So here at Jubilee, we strive to affirm the diversity of humans being in stage of life, in personality, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, skin color, race, culture, economic status, ability or disability, language, and where you find yourself on your spiritual journey. Welcome, just as you are. Let's join our voices in song. God is love, unfailing love, endless love, aching love. If it is not love, it is not God. We can trust this love forever. Unfailing love or mercy cannot be earned or deserved or hoarded. It just is, always, endlessly reaching out to us to heal, to inspire, to free us so we can be healers, inspirers, and lovers. I invite you to join me in prayer. God of unfailing love, Christ of mercy, spirit of compassion, show us your way as you pray in us today. Open our hearts to recognize you in our troubled world. Remove the blocks that keep us from reflecting your light and love. Show us your unfailing love and help us show the world this same mercy and compassion as we live in relationship with you, with our kin, with the earth, and with our enemies. In Christ, you break down the divisions that separate us. Give us wisdom to be thoughtful friends. When we don't know how to love, show us your way. O oh God of unfailing love, hear our prayers. We hold a moment of silence, praying in our hearts. My friends, God is love, unfailing love. If it is not love, it is not God. Trusting in this love, we know that we are forgiven and it is not earned. It just is. Thanks be to God. Amen. is good to see you. Do you remember the big long word we've been talking about for a couple weeks? 
Rejoice is a big and a long word, but it's a bigger word and it's longer. Citizenship, also an awesome word, not the one I was thinking of. It starts with st. st stewardess, they are awesome on planes. Very good at bringing you food. Stewardship. Stewardship, got it. You were very close. Yeah. So, and we talked about that being a part, a piece of understanding stewardship is how we use our talents, the, good, the things we can do in our time and our money to help others in our lives and in our world. And I have a very cool book about dots that is also about how we can help people in the world. And Graham's going to hold the mic so I can turn the pages. Thanks. So it's called We Are All Dots. And for those of you who really want to see the pages, there's only dots. They aren't that interesting of a page, really. It says, hi, I'm a dot. Can you see me? I'm down here. I don't live alone. I have friends. More dots. And my friends have friends, and their friends have friends. More dots. There are lots and lots of us on this page. Do you see all those dots? Yeah, I wonder too. Life is good. We have housing. What did they make a picture of those dots? Houses. We have fun things to do. A carousel. Ferris wheel. And food to eat. It's a burger. A burger counts as food, doesn't it? I think so. Oh. Hi. I'm a dot. Does that one look the same? No. That one's hollow. Hmm. So we've got solid dots and one hollow dot. Can you see me? I'm up here. There are lots and lots of us, too. Over here, life isn't so good. We have no housing, no fun things to do, no food to eat. Which kind of dot would you want to be? The solid one, not hollow, hey. Yeah. Oh, if you were a full dot, you would come and help the hollow ones. Let's see if that's what happens. We'd like to come over to your page. Wait, we have to decide if we will let you over on our page. Hmm, you think that's a good idea? You think you'd just say yes? You'd share. That's stewardship, isn't it? Sharing. Okay, some of you can come over to our page. Why only some? Good question. Yeah, why only some? Let's see if it tells us. Slowly. Calmly, safely. Hmm. S stop. That's enough. We can't all fit on this page. Uh, 
Oh, the hollow dots could bring some stuff to their page. The full ones could bring the hollow dots. We need another solution. You might have already come up with those ideas. That's it. Some of us will come over to your page. See how you've got some of both on both pages now? Pretty cool. You were right. We can help you. What's that a picture? We can help you. Yeah, you can help build houses. Exactly. And apartments. And condos. Together, we can achieve so many things. Can you see some of what they did together? Boats. Cars, tractors, buildings, a playground. So many things, so many things can happen when we work together. See that picture? Reaching out. Now, Graham, is there any ways that our church helps people who aren't on our page? There are. We make sure that we provide uh, donations to places like First United Church that do help others. So through us, we have other people that can help. We also provide space for people if they need to come and just talk to someone. I'm always here. And provide space for them to come and worship, even during the week when we're not worshiping on a Sunday morning. Uh, the thrift shop is a big way that we reach out to people that aren't part of our church and who are part of our church, too. There's a lot of ways that we do some of that stuff. And we work with uh, the Burnaby Homelessness Society to make sure that people can have food. And we get bread from Cobbs and give it to the church that helps people in that way. So through us, other people get help. So we do stewardship with people who have houses and food, and we reach out to people who don't have as much. All right. Anything else we should remember before we sing? Just keep being good helpers. Figure out ways that you can help others. It's always good to do. All right. We'll sing and then we're going to head up. A reading from the first letter to the Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, siblings, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourself know very well that the day of God will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant person, there will be no escape. But you, siblings, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others for those who sleep at night. 
Let us be clear, keep clear headed. But let us not be those who are drunk and get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be alert and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Jesus the Christ who died for us so that when we are awake or asleep, we may live with Christ. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. And reading from the gospel according to Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will come like this. Ten bridesmaids took their laps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil for their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake. Therefore, because you neither know the day nor the hour. Hear what the Spirit is saying through these ancient words of Scripture. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing together deep in our hearts. May the words of our hearts 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be graced by your wisdom and your love. Amen. Sometimes Jesus tells a story that just leaves me with questions. When I hear the story of the bridesmaids, I have to wonder, what are you doing to me, Jesus? And then a bit later, the question might change to become, how do we hear this story as one that is filled with God's grace? The story already expresses its bias. There are wise bridesmaids and there are foolish ones. And so often we tell this parable as, be like the wise ones, have extra oil, extra faith, extra preparedness. I'm not really a fan of telling the story in this way. People having made up their minds already, making judgments just based on the way that we read it. Because at the heart of Jesus' message has always been a generous God who invites us to generosity even at great cost to ourselves. So how would this God lock the door to those who are foolish and unprepared when all of Jesus' teachings have been about opening the door wide? I even think that the wise ones in the story almost have this smug self-satisfaction as they go off into the party. We got in because we're wise. Look at you. You're not prepared. Nah, 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 nah. Do you have any people like that in your lives? I wonder, don't they care about those who are left behind? Those who are outside? Those who are excluded? Their sisters? Their friends? How many of you suffer from FOMO? A fear of missing out. You know, you hear of one friend hanging out with another and you weren't invited. Or an invitation to a gathering that you didn't receive. If I were one of the foolish bridesmaids, I would be suffering terribly that I'm missing out on the party. Even if I'm just gonna go to the party and sit in the corner, because that's where I like to be, around a lot of people, but not necessarily in the midst of it. But not being in the story, my heart is also breaking when I think of my friends, people that we love, how they might be excluded from the loving kingdom of God because they didn't have enough faith or enough knowledge or enough commitment. This is not the God that we encounter in scripture. This isn't the Jesus that we encounter in scripture. Inside the house, there are a group who refuse to do what Jesus taught, to share generously, even if it means your own suffering. Outside is a group who are experiencing rejection despite their last ditched efforts to find oil, to come back, and they find the door locked. Which, if you remember, Jesus said would be opened. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Right there in Matthew 7, we're told this. Ask and it'll be given. Search and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who searches finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. So why do we have this story? A story of exclusion. The end of the parable might offer some more context and guide us in this excursion. Stay awake, for you know not the day or the hour. I know there's been many times when I, like the foolish ones, have been underprepared or ill-equipped for a task and must depend upon the cooperation and collaborative nature of others. Like the wise ones, I've not always shared what I have or helped those in need. But if we stay awake and we look around, if we're intentional about discipleship, about making disciples, then maybe folks won't be so prone to run around with insufficient oil in the first place. Maybe the wise ones would have been thinking for all of them, did you bring extra oil? Maybe go now so you can be ready. They could have been cultivating relationship rather than falling asleep waiting. Because waiting, waiting is hard. We can't simply tell people, yes, it's hard to wait. Waiting is full of excitement. Be prepared. The day of the Lord is coming. We need to confront and figure out how we choose to cope with the waiting. We can't simply, uh, because waiting is simply a reality of life. Not that this is how it is, get over it. 
kind of waiting, but that we choose to be in waiting and how we do that matters. Not necessarily for God, but for us. We want the wait to be over, but at the same time, we trust that God will show up. God will show up in the midst of any manifestation of our waiting. God will show up to be what we need God to be, depending on how we experience that time. If our waiting is experienced in fear, God comes with peace. If our waiting is experienced in longing, God arrives with deep and abiding satisfaction. If our waiting is experienced in anticipation, God accompanies us in the joy that should be our present. Rather than just keeping alert for what's to come, keep alert to the ways in which God enters into our present that attempts us at alertness, seems to bring exactly what we need. To keep awake does not mean the absence of God. It means to recognize our absolute dependence on the presence of God. Waiting for something way overdue, waiting for someone you're not sure will even come, waiting that involves active preparation when you're not sure what you should be preparing for, the kind of waiting is hard. But we're accustomed to it. Waiting for that Christmas that we all vividly remember from our childhood, going through the Sears catalog and making the list on full scat paper. Remember those days? Waiting for a phone call from a certain special someone, waiting for the news of a loved one's arrival safely while they're traveling. We all know what it is to wait, and we know how hard it can be, really hard, often tinged with anxiety. Words of waiting express what is almost unutterable, the lack of control, the fear of the unknown, the worry of whether or not we are ready, anxiety about being prepared for what is to come. Waiting carries a lot of emotions. Emotions because we're left outside. We're the foolish ones most of the time, unprepared, outside the door, waiting for the door to be opened. But also feelings like anticipation and wonder, eagerness and dread, agitation, fear, longing, loss. Much of our own emotional response is determined by that for which we wait. Our time of waiting will be experienced differently on what we're expecting. Sometimes the difficulty of waiting is not so much the spectrum of feelings, but the fact that we can't be content, content, content with the present. Whether we're waiting for something that's good or bad hardly matters. The anxiety and stress of living in the in-between time of waiting can be difficult. And this parable reminds us that we're not alone in our waiting. From the earliest Christians on, we have confessed that waiting can be most difficult. Moreover, Jesus tells his parable in his own in-between time, his own time of waiting. The parable is set between his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and his trial and his execution. And one thing that Matthew and all the evangelists agree on is that Jesus knew what was coming. So here he is teaching the crowds, facing off with his opponents, instructing his disciples, even as he waits for the coming cross. Jesus, too, knows how difficult waiting can be and is, and he is with us in our waiting. So what are you waiting for? What events are you looking forward to? What kind of waiting are you finding not only difficult but anxiety-producing, provoking? Is it a call from a doctor with test results? Perhaps a sign from a family member or friend with whom you've had an argument that all is going to be well? Is it waiting for the pain of bereavement to end? Waiting for something else? We have to admit that even this kind of waiting can be hard to sustain. We can grow weary in our work, frustrated by the lack of our outcomes, distracted by the thousand and one other obligations that fill each day of our lives. So let's admit that on any given day, each of us may discover we are a foolish bridesmaid. Given this reality, we reclaim church as a place where we can find help and support in our waiting, all types of waiting, and support as we try to live this discipleship, this Christian life. I find it striking that Paul closes the part of his letter to those in first century Thessalonia that found their own waiting nearly intolerable with these words. Therefore, encourage one another. 
they and we are waiting for Jesus' imminent return, 2,000 years later imminent. It's difficult for most of us to entertain, but we recognize that opportunities for waiting on Jesus' presence are all around us. Each time, for we, we, each time we work for justice, we testify to the presence of Jesus. Each time we bear each other's burdens, we testify to Jesus' presence. Each time we advocate for the poor or reach out to the friendless or work to make this world that God loves a better place, we testify to the presence of the risen Christ. That's our role. We wait for each other, wise and foolish alike. We sit vigil for each other at times of pain, of loss, of bereavement. We celebrate achievements and console after disappointment. We give hope when hope is scarce, comfort when it's needed, courage when we're afraid. We help each other to wait, to prepare, to keep the faith. We encourage each other with the promise of Christ. Ask, and it's given. Search, you'll find. Knock, the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. May it be so in your life as in mine. Amen. Let us pray together. <clears throat> Gracious and loving God, we thank you and we praise you for all that you have given us. For your Son, Jesus the Christ, our friend and Redeemer, in whose name this church exists. For our minister, Graham Brown. For our community life minister, Gabriel McClarty. For Jason Meyer, our office and facilitator coordinator. For Steve Roy, our custodian. For Deanna, our music director. For Mira Kitching, our Sunday program leader. For Andrew Burge, our tech uh, coordinator. And for all the many talented volunteers who work together and put together so successful events and programs including our thrift shop. 
Dear God, our hearts and minds go out to the land where Jesus spent most of his earthly life and which has once again been turned into a land of grief and turmoil with the two dominant peoples at war with each other. We hold the many thousands of innocent people on both sides of the conflict before you today as we pray for an end to violence and a lasting peace. A peace that is much more than a temporary end of fighting. We pray for, pray for the right people to be brought forward and a plan put in place that is pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian that takes care of the people on both sides of the conflict and ends hostilities permanently. Dear God, violence has taken its toll in so many places on this planet, including our own country, the USA, the Ukraine. Over 30 wars being fought in Africa alone, as well as many other places. Our hearts are broken when we see the carnage on television. And we thank you, God, for giving us the will to go on with what we do here not ignoring what the tragedies and the, what, is, what is happening elsewhere, but as a bulwark against being overcome by grief and anger as we strive for peace in our own lives as a community doing your work together. Dear God, there is a bomb in Gilead to heal the wrongs that are being committed a bomb that exists in every corner of the world. It is your unending healing love. Open the hearts of those who put their hopes in the weapons they possess. Help us to envision a Middle East with no conflict between Jews and Palestinians, a Europe living in harmony. Africa, free of large corporations vying for control of African resources and an end to racism. Dear God, a vision of peace has been proven and has been proven possible with your empowering love. In South Africa, after decades of violence, Nelson Mandela, who after 27 years in prison, emerged and he had gained the respect of his guards and many others by learning their language and conversing with many in the prison system and outside of it. He formed a singular purpose for himself, and that was to peacefully replace apartheid with a democratic system that works for everyone. Few believed that change could happen without a horrific war. Mandela was not alone. He is working with your people, the church, through his friend, Bishop Tutu. And Tutu had people internationally in churches, including our own Reverend Tim Stevenson, come and help with the count of the ballots in the historical election that put an end to apartheid. Peace and reconciliation can happen with the wars that are being fought presently and with your empowering love, O oh God. A lasting peace can be achieved. Dear God, may it be so, we pray. Let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So as we wait, we encourage each other we take some of the peace and shalom that is deep within ourselves and share it with another or receive it from another in a symbolic act of God's peace.
The thing that we share from ourselves doesn't take away from who we are, but it enhances the other person that we're with. And so we share a piece here, either with a handshake or a fist bump or some way of acknowledging the person that you're with. And we use words that sound like, may the peace of Christ be with you, and a response that sounds like, and also with you. But use whatever words you need to use and be here however you need to be here. So my friends, may the peace of Christ be with you all. Let's share that with friends and strangers alike. Be seated. Every week there are people who sign up for roles in worship, like praying, reading scripture, greeting, uh, being part of celebrating communion with us. And uh, we need people to sign up for those so that people will do them. Um, there's uh, an online link that you can fill out, or often we have a paper copy of it, so you can add your name to some of the spaces that are there. And we're just grateful for anyone that wants to try a new thing or people who've been doing it for a long time. This coming Saturday, the 18th, uh, there's a conversation happening, a cry for justice and peace about Israel and Palestine. It's at our Rumble location from one to three in the sanctuary and all are welcome to come to that conversation. Sweet Sounds on Sussex with Don Pemberton is coming up on Saturday, November 25th. How can it be the end of September, November? The end of September. <laughs> I'm going to be the end of November already in two weeks. So plan to come to that. Uh, our evening worship at Rumble is coming up on November 26th, and you're welcome to come and join us. We're going to be doing a sing-through of some of the hymns that are in a new hymn book that's uh, planned to come out from the United Church called Then Let Us Sing. And uh, it's one of those evenings where I invite you to come and be critical. I invite you to come and do it that time. I get it sometimes, other times when it's not invited, but this one's particular. 
uh, we'll be giving feedback to the National Church about some of the songs we sing and what we like about them, what we don't like about them, if they're easy to sing, if they're hard to sing, uh, all those sorts of things. So come out and uh, participate in that. And for all ages, we're having a, an Advent party on December 2nd. More information will come out about that. And then other things happen later, but we'll get to them when it gets closer. Christina, you're going to come say something. Morning. As many of you know, we are still working on our, our stewardship campaign with Generous Hearts. There are still three, for those of you who have not signed up for a community gathering yet, there are still three more happening this week. We have on Tuesday, we've moved the time of this one, it's from 6 until 7, it was a little later, and I think earlier hopefully will work better for some people. There is a mug up, which is like hot chocolate and snacks. It's something we use in Girl Guides is mug up. It's delicious. Uh, Deborah is going to be leaving that here from 6 to 7 on Tuesday evening. And there's a pancake breakfast here on Wednesday morning from 8.30 to 10 with Don and Gwen. And there is a wine and cheese on Friday with Pamela that is, again, going to be here. So they'll all be here, my central location. And then next Sunday on the 19th, we're wrapping up the campaign with a lunch right after the con off after the service so you are all welcome to stay for lunch after the service there will be soup and buns it's going to be a great time and we would please anybody who has participated or if you even if you haven't been able to make it to one of the community gatherings we do have some of the stewardship packages that we can hand out and they have a commitment card in them and we would appreciate if you could bring them back on the 19th so that we have that thank you thanks and as we've been doing each week, we're hearing from members of the congregation about why Jubilee. So I'd like to invite Kate and Victor forward. So everyone, my name is Victor. And uh, um, so how, let me just introduce myself to you guys. So again, my name is Victor. I am born and raised in Hong Kong, and I came to Canada first to do my grad school in the East Coast, and then I moved to uh, now the West Coast, married to this wonderful woman, and I intend to stay here. Um, so <laughs> why do I don't donate the time and uh, money to uh, Jubilee is, uh, since a kid, I was taught that uh, it is important to um, give to the Church of God, and uh, it is one of the things that you can actually test God with. Um, but to me right now, I think it is a very important way to, giving, uh, to give back to the Church and uh, keep the work of God going on, on earth. And um, I, I like to come to this Church because it is very welcoming, and it's very welcoming not in a pushy way. And I think it's very important for, for a lot of us. Um, the message that uh, I hear is very relatable and applicable, and that the events that's held by, in this church or by this church is very lively and it's very inclusive, which I really enjoy. And uh, my name is Kate. Um, I am currently getting a biology degree in restoration ecology, and I'm fairly new to United Church. We've been going for about a year. Um, my story is that I was raised in a high control, high demand fundamentalist Christian church. And during the pandemic, I had time to reflect and realize I didn't want to be a part of a church that doesn't care about truth and reconciliation or climate change. Um, and uh, I also realized that some of the damage that was done to me by that type of of church environment. Um, when I was a child, teenager, I realized that I was attracted to both boys and girls, and it was very scary for me. So this is my first time uh, attending an affirming church, and it's really been good for my soul. And I really care about giving back to Jubilee United because I believe in having reciprocal relationships within your community. And so I'm really thankful to be welcomed here and a part of this community. Thank you both so much. One of the ways that we celebrate each other is to recognize birthdays and anniversaries. And so this week we wish Grant a happy birthday and Lane and Sam a happy anniversary. We're grateful for 
your lives and what you bring to us in community. We have come to worship God to express our love. Part of that involves putting love into action. So we do so in the act of presenting our offering for the love of others. Our tithes and offerings will now be received. Loving God, you have given us abundantly of talent, time, and resources. We return but a portion in thanksgiving for all we have, asking that it be used to further your work and action of hope and peace in the troubled world. Our hearts overflow with love and compassion. You have blessed us with loved ones who care for us, healers who show mercy and companions for the journey. We offer in return a small portion of our resources and a large amount of gratitude. Receive all that we offer and transform it into wholeness for our needy world. Amen. God is love, unfailing love, endless love, aching love. If it is not love, it is not God. May we know that the eternal God is with us, giving us faith and strength and supporting us as we move into the world. God is always near us, lifting us and opening us to the needs of others. 
May we embrace God's courage to be radically generous, to forgive, to listen with compassion. May God guide us to be generous in love and understanding. May the eternal God nudge us by the Spirit and renew us in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.